you know, it's, it's so simple in a way, like you're trying to get to A to B and you have everything you need with you. Welcome to the Low Tide Boys, a swim run podcast. I'm Chip. I'm Chris. And this is episode 50. This is officially our carbon fiber episode. Today we have the founder of Frank Paddle, Frederick Bankson. Um, as most, if not all, triathletes, current or former, would understand, we're going to majorly geek out on this interview <laughs> about all things carbon fiber, the design process, and the future of swim paddles and swim run. Can't wait to share this interview with you later in the show. Yeah, I really... Uh... Fascinating. Fascinating. From minute one. Yeah. Fascinating. On to this week's shout outs. So we are shouting out all of our listeners in oh. Porto Alegre. Alegre, Brazil. They have a bustling swim run scene in southern Brazil, and we're grateful for everyone tuning into the show. Muito obrigado. Which, uh, many thanks. Many thanks. Now, for everyone's favorite mid-show theme song, This Week in Swim Run, powered by RaceID.com. All right, so we actually have a little bit of an update this week. A uh, cool race took place this past weekend in Cape Town, South Africa. The hashtag Get Wrecked Cape Experience Swim Run, put on by, try to say that three times fast, put on by Torpedo Swim Run, looked like a lot of fun. On their website, they refer to the sport as, quote, wildly cool, and obviously we, we yeah. would agree with that sentiment. The photos of the event looked amazing with beach runs, rough open water swims, and of course, the typical smile at the finish line by all the participants. Um, as a programming alert, we're already working on getting the race director, Richard, on the show to chat about all things uh, in the swim run scene down in South Africa. Additionally, our friends Fanny and Desiree's Champions Christmas Challenge, it's on its third week. It's almost nice. over. So I hope you're still putting your daily Ks. Uh, this week's social media theme is uh, around Christmas trees. So post up your pics wearing Christmassy tree stuff, I guess, for a chance to win awesome prizes. Even a coveted Low Tide Boys oh, t-shirt. And we have been dropping some very relevant topical memes that right, like coincide if, <laughs> with the Christmas challenge. If our memes weren't niche enough, yeah. we're just taking it to a nichier level. Um, finally, Atala has opened its World Championship registration window. So go to their press release, which we link to in the show notes to get all the details on how to enter. Registration is open until January 20th, 2021. So make sure that your race results are up to date. And may the odds be forever in your favor. And a note on that, actually, we, if for some reason you did a race, but you didn't log it, for some reason, the load, we didn't log any of our races this year. And it took me about maybe five to 10 minutes to get all of our races and all of our times in. So it's not a hassle. If you don't see your stuff in there, don't freak out. It's really easy to do. Yeah. And do it. If that's, if that's your goal, go for it. So that's it for this week. Email us to tip us off on stuff and anything you want us to mention on the show. Happy to do it. Yes. And now for updates, we have shirts and stickers shipping out. So be sure to head to our website to show off your low tide pride. We'll, we're shipping those out as soon as we can to hopefully they get it there before the holidays. Uh, but, you know, we can't do anything that the post office can't do. Uh, if Also, we're thinking of getting some, some hats made, hats, beanies, things, toboggans, things to go on your dome. So let us know if you think that's a good idea or not. Uh, via you know whichever medium you choose hey i take a hat no i don't want one i got enough hats that kind of yeah. stuff helps us sort out what, what we should be doing yeah but don't get too specific don't be like yeah can i get a red i need a red you know, hat yeah i don't know we can Sounds like a dr seuss one. book yeah red hat pool boy now on <laughs> to this week's interview with frank paddle yeah so as we mentioned at the start of the show um he has a really interesting background and pretty much like a, he had an early love for all things carbon fiber from his days as a professional windsurfer. Yep, you heard that right. That led circuitously to triathlon and ultimately to swim run. In this interview, we chatted with Frederic about his windsurfing days, traveling the world, how he found triathlon and eventually became a certified coach and how he did his first swim run race on a whim. We talked about all things carbon fiber as well, including how he got the idea to, to make carbon fiber paddles and, and how he eventually decided to go all in and start Frank Paddle. We talked about his design process and what he thinks makes for great swim paddles. So, yeah. He a even lot of good answered stuff. 
the question, yeah. what size swim paddle should you yes. use? Yes, his answer was very political, but I think also very accurate. But we're not going to spoil it any more than that. But That's we asked that question because swim paddles is, a, is an interesting topic that we're taking on as a, you know, we want, we just want to know what people think about it. Yeah. And, you know, we want you to know that we're going to ask the hard questions. <laughs> when they come up, we're going to press for answers. So be sure to follow Frank Paddle on frankpaddle.com or Frank Paddle on Instagram. Until then, enjoy the show. Enjoy. Frank Paddle, carbon our, fiber. Our lightest show. This show weighs in at like eight grams. <laughs> Hey, we're very stoked to have Frederick Bankson on the show. He's from Sweden. He's the creator of Frank Paddles. Welcome to the show, Frederick. Thank you so much for having me. Stoked to be on. Yeah, so so we've been trying to make this happen for a few months. So I'm really glad that that we're the schedule's finally aligned. But before we start talking about Frank Paddles and in your experience in Swim Run, why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of how you grew up in sports? Um, I know that you used to be a professional windsurfer. Can you just dive into that a little bit for us? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm from from Sweden and we are pretty big on sports. Um, and I was doing sports my whole life growing up, like soccer and, and playing hockey and like most sports, basically. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when I was nine... I just like fell in love with windsurfing and like on the West coast of Sweden, where I grew up and where I live, it's, uh, it's very windy and it's really good for windsurfing, like wave windsurfing. Mm. Um, and I just got super hooked on it. And that was my, like my one true passion in life, basically for a good decade and a half. Wow. And, uh, I was competing a lot and, it's kind of like one of those things where you are like some people can say like, Oh, they have talent for example, but it's it's so much like dedication and you're so into your sport. It kind of comes natural. Mm. So like, um, I never felt like I was training like that came kind of later, like in my twenties, I kind of started feeling like I was training. Um, but it was all just fun. Windsurfing is a really cool sport. It has a lot of uh, ele- and like elements that's kind of pretty similar to um, to swim run, just like with being in nature, um, right? And like with whatever that entails. Like sometimes it's mm. really nice, and sometimes it's snowing and you know blowing a storm. Wow! <laughs> and you got to be ready for anything, kind of just just to very similar to swim run. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you you have the gear to be able to go out, even if it's a nice breezy summer day or if it's a full-blown storm. So, you know, it's um, it's really fascinating to me to to hear, like, it sounds like at a really young age you fell in love with this and it became your passion, but what's that like when you're, you know, 11, 12 years old and you're like, this is the one thing that I'm passionate about or that I'm most passionate about? Like, was it, was it, did it just seem like this is just all you ever wanted to do? Or, or was it more like, hey, I'm having a lot of fun with this. I'm good at it. Let me just see where this goes. It was kind of, I had a really hard time being, you know, a teenager and think of having a normal job. Mm, yeah. Uh, like I, I couldn't imagine not trying at least to become like a full-blown professional um, mm-hmm. windsurfer. And um, I mean, that passion kind of held on all the way until it didn't feel like a passion anymore. And that's, you know, the day that I eventually, you know, canceled all my, or I didn't resign my contracts and mm-hmm. stop competing. Um, Cause it came to a point where all my, like I found myself in Venezuela after being on Hawaii after, I don't even remember, like I've been somewhere else, super exotic, yeah. like in amazing uh, location. And I was like miserable. I was just mm-hmm. training to become, you know, the next level. Uh, and it, totally took away everything that was fun about it. Wow. Wow. And then, and then, uh, yeah. So then it was like, that was when you were like, let me just walk away. Yeah. I, I was like, I'd rather have like, keep a little bit of the love for the sport and leave the professional, like the competitive side of it. Mm -hmm. Um, then to like totally burn out and never want to, you know, look at that equipment or talk to those people ever again. 
Yeah. Now, sometimes this, when you hear a story like this, and it does sound, I, I definitely kind of felt for you when you said that, you know, you had been to these places that people dream of just going once in their entire life for a vacation, and you're hitting three of them within the summer, pretty much, it sounds like. Did you just completely walk away and didn't touch anything for a couple of years, or did you just kind of dial it back? You got out of the professional thing, but you still went out every weekend on the mornings and, and went and did some windsurfing, or what, what was your kind of process for that? It was kind of, I think for almost a year, I, I was totally like, I didn't, I wasn't in contact with the sport whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I've always been like, since I was early teenager, like, in like windsurfing equipment is extremely expensive. It's, you know, it makes triathlon seem kind of (laughs) normal. So when I was 13, I started working like three afternoons a week plus like weekends and all the summer just to pay for my own gear oh yeah okay so um and that job when i was you know late teens um that like i used to work at that place full time um and i started working there again after like a year being away from Ah. that Interesting. So, so, so you transition away from being a professional windsurfer, but you're obviously still very active and and athletic. Where did um, like trash tri- triathlon and sort of swim run pop onto your radar? So triathlon, like I for those years after competing, I was just I don't know. I didn't have a purpose. You know, when you go from having a like a a passion that just basically is a, a part of every little part of you and your life and your daily routine. And then that disappears. Like it, I had a big void that I didn't really fill with anything. So I would kind of like, I would still windsurf a little bit. It was still a lot of fun, but I didn't have anything that like, you know, smet, swept me away kind of. Mm. And then when I was 20, I think I was 26, 20, uh, 26, I think. Um, a friend that I knew that was an extremely good windsurfer, he, he was talking about doing an Ironman and that, that story just like, when I heard what he, how he described, like trying to finish the run and like cramping and, you know, crying and laughing at the same time, (laughs) I was like, that's what I want to do. That sounds like, that sounds like a mission. Yeah. And, and that really, like, so basically when I started training for a triathlon like iron man was the only thing that was like worthy in, mm. in my head yeah like just the hardest like the what's, only challenge what's the hardest enough. experience yeah yeah wow interesting and then um and then so so i'm assuming you successfully negotiated an, an iron man <laughs> and uh and and then and then where when did you first learn about swim run and participate in one so that was my, I had a friend that I was training with, um, who was also into doing Ironmans and he, um, he always liked more like the adventure kind of races. He did, uh, like Alp marathon runs and like more multi-sport kind of races. That was his, his passion. Uh, and he was like, there's a race up in Stockholm. Um, do you want to be in my team? Cause and you can help me with the swim. Because <laughs> um, he wasn't a very strong. He was a decent swimmer. Uh, but he was like, it's... He wanted he, you to tow him. He, uh, him. <laughs> he ba- basically wanted me to pull him. And uh, and he was like, I'll, I'll pay for your entry and the travel and everything. So I was like, okay, let's go. That sounds like fun. That's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So we went up to Amphibiamannen. I think this is 2014. I don't think it's 2013. It must have been 2014. Um, and it was super cool, but I was so into um, like the whole Iron Man because Iron Man was still so new to me. Yeah. That like I never, I, like I didn't see myself doing a lot of, of swim runs because it was like, you know, in Sweden, they would be in the season of all the triathlons. Right. And then 2015, when we were traveling, so I, I started traveling a lot to be able to train, um, 
to be doing training the whole winter. Mm-hmm. Um, ah. so, and during that time, that's when they released the um, Ironman coaching certification. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hmm. And I've always been like, I've been coaching a ton in windsurfing. I have a certification for for a coaching there and even coached it at um, what would be basically a college that we have in, in my town. Hmm. Um, so I was teaching a lot of people to windsurf. And so it's kind of, it was like, I really love doing that. So it was a natural transition to be, you know, cause I was so passionate about triathlons mm-hmm. and during that time I, I was doing a lot of ocean swimming and I really, I don't know, I, I grew up on the ocean, like in a little sleepy little summer town, basically. Mm-hmm. And when I was a kid, we, we, you know, when we were like seven, we would go swimming like five times a day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, swim, and it go was have a kind snack. of like in, so, you know, in the environment we have around here with, you know, the archipelago. Yeah. So it was, you know, I think that's why swim run is so, um, you know, it's, it's so simple in a way. Like you're trying to get to A to B and you have everything you need with you. Yeah. yeah. But I also think, I think even deeper than that, I think you just mentioned it, like the way, like it makes sense to me that swim run was invented in Sweden just because of what you described what your childhood was like. Like we've heard that from other guests. It's like, oh, I just grew up doing this and then it turned into a sport. So, you know, I love it. This is, it feels like home, right? To just go island to island or just, you know, do whatever you want, be in nature. Um, is that, is that sort of, I mean, would, would you kind of agree with that, with that sentiment? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. It's, um, it's, I mean, a, a large part of, of Sweden has that kind of coastline. Uh, with cliffs and, um, and and small islands, so it's a it's a yeah it's a, it's a kind of a natural. I, I mean, the first time I I ever heard the the name swim run, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That sounds like <laughs> Why not? Totally. So your coach, like so many sports, they're like, yeah, you need this stick, and then you're on skates, and it's ice, and then you have a little goal, and then it's forty five people, and you're gonna shoot the ball. Yeah, and then you know, a book of rules. And here it's like, yeah, you go A to B over those islands, like a couple of islands, and uh, that's the race. And you're just tied to somebody. The simplicity of it, I I think, is probably pretty attractive. I mean, when you're explaining it the first time to somebody, it's complex because there's lots, you kind of have to, they think it's one run and then one swim, but you kind of have to explain the transitions and then the partner and then you're forgetting stuff. But yeah, I mean, it, it is when you think about it, you're just going from A to B on whatever route that you kind of want and you can swim some of it and you can run some of it and you're doing it with a friend. Yeah. That's essentially the <laughs> the stilling of swim run down. So you, yeah. you're coaching, you're coaching triathletes, you're racing still triathlons here in 2014, 15, at, I, I'm assuming as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then where did sort of the idea that you needed to make a carbon fiber swim paddle come from? And where did the, like, where, where did the Frank paddle come from? Um, so the first time that I ever thought of it is like, like I've been working. So there's a company here that um, like that uh, he's an old windsurfer as well, like an old competitive windsurfer. He has a carbon fiber, like manufacturing company. Ah. Um, and I, w- I started working for, for them like on and off, like off season, like some extra hours here, here and there. And some, a couple of years I did full time. So I think I have like 15,000 hours of working with carbon fiber through my lifetime. Wow. wow. Okay. And so when I started swimming a ton, I was like, why is, why is, why, why are we using plastic? And it was like bendy and flexy and heavy. It's like, it doesn't make sense because windsurfing and I mean, triathlon bikes as well. I mean, it's all about lightweight, you know, the right flex. Windsurfing kit sounds like kind of like an F1 car or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's all carbon fiber. I I mean, I had, since I was like 10 years old, I basically had all carbon fiber gear. Wow. And that's why I had to work all the time. Yeah. (laughs) You better pay for all that carbon. (laughs) Yeah, so so um so you're like I see a problem and I think I know the solution. And so so how long before 
well, how long did you have the idea and how long before that idea actually became Frank Paddles? Did you start right away kind of tinkering with it or did you sit on it for a while? Yeah, the first idea, I I started Googling it and I like I, I couldn't find anything on it. So this must be like 20, I think in 2015, I started looking into it and I there was nothing. So in a way, I was like, there's got to be a reason. Like, why you wouldn't use it? Mm-hmm. In my mind, it wasn't so much for for swim run at that point. Actually, it was more like I want to have a really good, like, um, stable paddle for my swimming because I use paddles so much in my training. I would use them every every workout, five days a week in the pool. Uh, in some, you know, in some form. Right. Wow. Um, and so when I started making them, the, like the first couple of prototypes, I never forget because a, a old friend of mine that's a carbon freak as well. Uh, he's an ex pro bi- uh, cyclist. Oh yeah, they love and, that. Stuff. And I was talking with him, and I was like, I, I was I'm thinking of making carbon fiber swim paddles, and he was like, Why? I'm like what? Are you kidding me? Well, you love carbon fiber. He's like, Yeah, no, no one's gonna pay for it. Maybe maybe it'll work, but no one's gonna buy it. Like what? Oh, maybe oh, that sucks. What a downer! And, wow. And actually, the first <laughs> prototype I made, like he tested it, and he was like, "No, nah, it's not good." <laughs> I don't oh, wow. Like it. So, I, so I had to go back and be like, "Okay." So, and that was a pretty simple construction, uh, which would have been an, a construction that would be possible to, you know, make them half the cost, basically. Right. Mm, okay. And it didn't work. I was like, this sucks. Okay, I'll try it this way. It's much, you know, it's much more labor intense and more expensive in materials. But, and then I tried that and that was, that was a the ticket. first one was okay. Like, so the second prototype and the third one was like, oh, now, now I get it. Now I know what I need to nice. start looking into doing. And then, I mean, the first, the first model I, I, I actually sold, I'd made 50 prototypes of different paddles. Wow. Oh. Stiffness and holes. And that's why it's so much fun sometimes when I read comments um, of like how a paddle should be. Because I've tested, you know, 50 of my own and then probably 20 other brands like plastic paddles, yeah. just to like for reference. Um, and uh, I, I mean, today, the, the, the model that I released a few months ago is. Compared to the that first one I released, it's like space age in between. Right. Wow. Man, I'm this is so curious. This is so fascinating to me. I'm gonna have to dig in on this a little bit for if you don't mind. Do you can we call you Frank? Is that okay actually? Or can I call you Frank? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, Frank. Thanks. So a self proclaimed carbon fiber freak, which you know, I appreciate that. For the layman's, I know the answer. Our listeners might not though. Why is carbon fiber so expensive? to produce and like why is a bike at target or you know wherever a couple hundred dollars versus a carbon fiber bike why is that ten thousand dollars like what's what how come (laughs) i think there's a little bit more of a range there but yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i mean there's basically two parts um so one is the material itself so to make carbon fiber uh you take an organic polymer and then you basically you it's like the process is super uh, complicated, but basically what you do is you take a fiber and you pull it through a, a bunch of different chemical and heating. So they heat it up to five and a half thousand Fahrenheit uh, with zero oxygen. So then they make the, so, so what you kind of, the end product is like long strings of molecules that bound together um, mm-hmm. with carbon atoms. And those, like, they're very, very long. And so what you get is something that, like, if you pull on it, it's it's extremely strong. Like, it, it doesn't flex. Okay. So what you can do, you can use then, like, super thin uh, carbon fiber and make it really stiff compared to how, um, how uh, light it is, so how heavy it is. Okay. So the material is... is- is labor intensive to produce and expensive because you have to heat it up with probably really expensive 
machines yeah, you, you and need stuff. Special and machinery. then you need a lot of this material because they're all in these really thin fibers. And, yeah. and, and then, then they make to, that into a weave. Then you have to like weave that cloth. all together. So it's kind of like, yeah. uh, yeah. And the weave wow. and the weave is for, um, I mean, the reason you want to weave is because the stiffness is directional. So um, on the longitudinal of the atoms, like it'll be super stiff, but across them, it's actually, it can still be brittle. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Are you reading that from somewhere? How do you no, know that? No, I'm a carbon fiber freak myself. <laughs> you don't know that? Too? You don't know that? I do now. Oh, yeah. I know what I'm getting for Christmas. I was carbon all about fiber. saving like four grams here and there, you know. And then, so the, the second part to like, let's say a, a bike, like why that's more expensive if it's carbon fiber compared to if it's uh, aluminum mm. or some sort of steel. Uh, the big difference is that you have to put all, like it's all handmade. So even if you're buying something that's, you know, from China, like a, like a cheap carbon fiber bike, it's still made by hand and you cut out different so because the, the carbon fiber has strength going one way, um, you have to combine different um, part, like different parts of carbon in order to get it strong where you need it to be strong mm. and flexy where you want it to be flexy. Okay. Right. So a bike will have, you know, hundreds of small segments of carbon fiber that have their specific part on the bike. Wow. Yeah, like, That's for example, like your bottom bracket, you want that to be super stiff, so then you're right. not, like, basically creating yeah. friction. Um, and then you want the top tube to be, to absorb some, some uh, you know, vibrations, some movement yeah. and some vibrations. Because if you make it super stiff, you, you're just going to be, it's just going to vibrate the whole bike. Wow. So, so, so then bringing that to paddles, I mean, I guess that you, you want a certain amount of stiffness, but you also want it to be, I guess, a little bendy depending on, on whatever elements also, you're going to be in, yeah. right? That, that's a lot of like, that's when you start working uh, in what's called a sandwich construction. Mm-hmm. So you have a core material that is not carbon fiber that has a lot of air into it. So it's super light. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they also have it. So we have that in, of course, different variations and in different uh, densities, so different weights. Uh, so with the thickness of that material and the type of carbon fiber and the angle of the carbon fiber, you can totally, I can make a paddle that's extremely soft or I can make one that's hard as a rock, you know, that doesn't flex at all. This is, this is crazy. So the, the cool part about making it with a composite material. So it's different materials combined that makes the, the end product. Mm-hmm. The cool thing about that is you can change it. You can make it however you want it to be. So if someone told me, oh, I want this to be, you know, half as stiff. I, I can make something that's half as stiff. Or if you want it to be even more durable against rocks, for example, you can introduce a different material on the outside to protect the carbon fiber. Mm-hmm. Wow, this is I'm I'm loving this. Okay, so you're <laughs> testing fifty different paddles and and whole layouts for your your wrist strap or your finger strap. Kind of where do you start? Like where's the big chunks that you're that you're trying to optimize right away versus the one that's like okay, I'm going to move these three holes two millimeters to the left and and then reprint this paddle versus. What's the big sweeping changes that you're kind of making to to optimize those first few prototypes that you had? A lot of it was shape and flex. Okay. And, and the first model had a different shape that had a rounded, for like the one I, I really liked that kind of shape for my first uh, the first model that was called the blue, um, because I really liked the way it it moved in the water with the kind of stroke that I used to have myself, mm. uh, which was a longer, slower stroke. Um, and then but the biggest difference that, that was like the eye opener for me was the fact that I could actually see that I was improving my, my speed with the same effort or actually less. I, I felt like I was using less force for a slight increase in speed. Gotcha. And and the, actually, one thing is when you pull the paddle through the water, uh, 
like with the carbon fibers, I never found them to be wobbly. Like I, they never started to like go on, you know, sideways on you mm-hmm. because of the turbulence. Oh, interesting. Because a, a paddle is really interesting because when you, when you stick your hand in it, you, you work with, um, with a linear flow. So as soon as you start pulling in the water, it, it just turns into a lot of turbulence. And for me, it was controlling that turbulence that made my the, the paddles uh, behave better, for lack of a better description, uh, to behave better in the water. Okay. Yeah. So I felt like I was saving my shoulders. Like I didn't have, you know, have you ever used a paddle that's super, super flexy and you just get tired in your shoulders, like your delts? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How you have to like control the paddle? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like the entry level paddles that have like a lot of holes in them can can be can be like that. Um, now, some paddles also have like a little bit of texture on them to, I think, help with that turbulence. Um, is that something that you found was helpful or not helpful? And when you were designing yours, yeah, the first one I actually i i noticed that i and i um, the paddle had more control when I had that texture on it. Um. Uh, and it also helped, you know, gave it grip and also gave it actually a little bit of um, like that surface made it a little bit tougher against, um, you know, rocks, like scrapes, climbing and stuff. Yeah. Um, but with, actually with the second uh, paddle that I, I launched a, a few months ago, um, I have a different finish on it, like a matte finish. And that just for some reason that felt better with this shape and I don't really have a good explanation for it, but it is very different and it's thinner as well. The paddle. Nice. So, okay. You, you made a couple prototypes. You gave one, to your buddy, he, he kind of poo-pooed on it a little bit. You went back to the drawing board. At what point did you kind of have something that people were, you know, I mean, you're, you can't buy your paddles on your website. Like you don't have stock on them. So they're obviously the demand is higher than, than the supply or at least the supply you're willing to produce, I suppose. Um, so, so where did you kind of like realize that, Hey, I really have something here or were you totally fine? Just, Hey, I made something for myself and it helps what I want to do. And I'm cool with just, if, if I'm the only one who uses these, that's fine with me. <laughs> I, yeah. It came to that point. I was really, uh, you know, I tried it out. I had quite a few people, like buy some of the early, like the early models and try prototypes for me and like give me their honest opinions. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it was never like, you know, lightning from the clear blue sky okay. kind of. It was more, it was something that was creeping. It's like, yeah, maybe. Because, you know, initially I wasn't, it wasn't towards um, swim runners. It was more, you know, triathletes that wanted to have something fancy in the pool. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you're just using it for training, like you don't care if, oh, today I didn't have to lift 1,100 pounds on my swim session because I had a lighter paddle, you know? So I was, then it was just mm-hmm. the, the stability and some, I wasn't sure that people would care enough, to be honest. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess for training, yeah, I can see why that wouldn't be a thing. But for swim run, I mean, uh, a friend of the show. Um, and friend of Frank Paddle. Yeah, G Flow and Tobias from Germany. I mean, I think it was G Flow who basically shared the hot take with us that he thinks that every winner of, you know, That's major, major swim run races in the future are going to be using carbon fiber paddles. So so I think he's he sold on it, but... Um, for our listeners, like why, why, I mean, do, do you, do you agree with that statement? Do you think that carbon fiber paddles for swim runs specifically, um, are that much of a game changer? Yeah, I think so. It's especially the longer race. No, actually I would say the short race, it, like shorter races with short swim legs still needs you to push harder. So if you can gain one second, you know, on a 200 meter stretch. Yeah that's still a second, like that's win or lose sometimes. Um, so I would say, I think, you know, uh, definitely. Um, I think as with a lot of sports, there's also a little bit of a retro 
pushback in a way. Like you want to have the old school stuff. You don't want to have the high tech yeah. latest. Um, on, until you get to a point where, where it's super obvious, of course. Yeah. And then I see here you have a new for fall. You just released your, your swim run version of the paddle. Tell us yeah. a little bit about the like R and D process about that. Why you even decided to make a swim run specific one? Um, actually, that that one is like the first model that I released. Like that one, I'm I'm probably going to take it off completely because I, you know, the the swim run, the way that one is made, is so far beyond that. It's I f- almost feel silly if I would try to keep selling the first model. Wow. Right. Um, and I mean, it's also, I mean, it's, you know, I use a 3d printer in house and make a couple of parts. So it's has, it has, a, a plastic on the edge and where the holes are, which also makes it a lot tougher on rocks or like wear and tear, mm-hmm. which, and also if, if you hit it against something, it's not going to create a sharp, you know, something you can cut. Like if you have a carbon fiber paddle, it's all carbon fiber. If you if you break that in some way in the edge, Sharp. you know that's a that's a dull knife. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. Ouch. so it's also it's safety and it's uh, also performance because it's it's more exact. Uh, so the, it's way higher precision. Uh, and then I also have um, a, a different material, both in the core and and in the bottom, to be able to take up more. Uh, you know, the rough life of a swim run paddle. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting banged around. They're stuffed here, hitting rocks, yeah. hitting people. Especially on race day, like race day is a little bit like, you know, with gear in a lot of sports, like you kind of putting your gear on the line, to like make it or break it kind of, mm-hmm. but in training people are way, you know, they're more uh, careful with their equipment, you know, yeah. your wetsuit or whatever. You're not going to scrape it and dest- destroy it on, in a training day, but on race day, you don't really care. Right. True. But it's also that, I mean, that's why I, little, I, I mean, I, I made, um, the, the finger lead, the finger pulley system that's on my, uh, my paddles. Yeah. I made that in a way so you can flip it with your hand. I, I don't know if you saw, that I just on. saw the video. We just shared it on our Instagram account. We'll, we'll be sure to like include it in the show notes or, or, or save it so you can see, but a very, very efficient, kind of when you talk about transitioning from swim to run or vice versa, the ability to basically have your hands be usable to grab rocks or, or scramble across whatever, basically flip your, you kind of flick your paddle to the backside of your hand. So it's on, you know, on the backside of your hand. So your fingers are, are, are free to, to grab and do whatever you need to do. Um, which, which that's a pretty, it's a pretty little, nifty invention you have for yourself here i love this little strap so so when i so i was a little bit because so next year i'm going to do a lot of races with my friend um that i uh we just decided to to do a couple of races together um so i'll be doing a lot of the swim run events as many as i can nice uh same here so, yeah. so I like, should, I give, I was like, should i give this away this is, I, I've never seen it before. I don't know if anyone, if someone has done it before, you please let I me haven't, know. So I, I haven't seen this before. Yeah. It's Cause I don't want, I mean, I'm not sharing it as if it's my invention, but I just found it like interesting to see if people know how to do it or have done it. But everyone I shared it to so far, like no one has said that, Oh, I do that all the time. Yeah. I mean, basically kind of, I know we're trying, I'll, I'll try to paint a picture with my words here on, on the podcast, but it's kind of like a lock lace, elastic style. What is that? Two mil maybe. And then there's a little, uh, uh rubber. Yeah. It, it kind of looks like a big wedding ring <laughs> on the backside of your thing with an adjustable toggle. So you can kind of yank it and loosen it and you don't have to worry about it breaking or totally falling through the other side of the hole. Um, yeah. But the elastic part, I think, is the really key part that allows you to flip it around um, yeah. when you're exiting. And the thing, like the whole, I, I experimented so much, and I sent out some to to the people that that um, helped test my paddles and the systems. And the first ones I sent out, they were like, "Nah, it sucks. Like I don't like it." Oh no! <laughs> oh no! 
But, yeah, but it, I mean, that's good. That's, that's the feedback I want. I don't, if, if everyone is kind of just like, yeah, it works. It's good, but it's not good. I mean, that it's horrible information for me. Like I want to know the true, someone's true opinion so I can change it and make it as good as possible. Yeah. yeah. So I, that was just like, Oh, back to the drawing board for, and you know, figure it out. And then, you know, I had to go to some weird places to find the materials to, you know, even though it looks like a little tube, it's like it had to be, you know, able to take chemicals and able to take salt and like temperature changes. Wow. Um, and I, so far, I mean, I've been using it for like eight months. It seems to be lasting stuff. Swim run, so we'll see. Right. We'll know, <laughs> we'll know eventually. Yeah, it'll, it'll be exposed if there's a fault in it soon enough. I mean, it's, it's, but the good, so one of the things about that system, I'm sorry for the listeners that don't have the picture in front of you, but it'll be on the show notes. Don't worry. (laughs) They're following right along right now. So it's two loops. uh, And what happens is if it's, um, it's polyester coated, the, the rubber inside. So, and it's a lot of small rubber strings inside of the, like the cover. So if you would like, let's say you, you slide it over a piece of glass and it, one of them breaks, you can still use it. You can still like put it together and pull that through the, um, the hole. Like yeah. The cord, like the pulley cord. It's a similar setup. Oh, what, yeah. um, what I've seen on goggles, actually kind of the two elastic straps. So it, it looks very similar to some kind of a goggle mount. Yeah. So I just felt like if you're doing a long race, you don't want to have to bring, you know, a ton of spares. Yeah. Of course, you'll have maybe a spare of, of goggles with you mm-hmm. on a long race, but you don't want spare cords and, you know, paddles. And you want to keep, you want to bring as little as uh, possible. Yeah. So, Frank, w- what's the type of swim runner or, or person that is coming to you to try to, to, try to purchase swim run, uh, Frank paddles? Are they are they at the tip top of their game and they're looking for that extra edge and this is it or uh, somebody that just wants uh, you know a cool paddle in the pool or swim running? It, I think it's. I mean, the, since launching the swim run, it's actually. I mean, I've sold to. I think most of the countries that has a swim runner in it. To be honest, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I sell, like, the first model was only to Sweden. And the second model is, I mean, it's all of Europe. It's, uh, like, all the countries. Mm -hmm. It's America. Uh, South America still, I don't know if they, when they're going to catch on. But but it's, uh, Europe is really big on, on, uh, it's really catch. I mean, you can tell that swim run is growing crazy fast because it's everywhere. Well, it's such a great sport. Yeah. I mean, I'm biased, but you a know, little bit. I think, We're a little biased, uh, I think it's but... a great sport. So, so, yes. so, so, Frank, wh- where do you see like wh- what are what are your 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 goals for for Frank Paddles? Like, are you you want to have a diversified line? You, are you thinking other products? Um, like, wh- where do you see the brand in the next few years? Um, I think a little bit like the whole idea behind Frank Paddle, why it even started, and why I'm doing it the way I do is that I'm, I really don't like when something is, you know, you design it in your country and then you ship it away to have it made, you know, in, in China and then you send it back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like the fact of having it locally, you know, in Europe, in Sweden, in my town, like in my own, uh, you know, factory. Um, and, and having them handmade, like I don't want, I, I don't want to outsource it ever. And, uh, I don't, I, I'm going to do everything I can to never, ever be in a position where I have to make them somewhere that's not like in America or Sweden or like Europe for sure. But like, I don't want to send them off to like a sweatshop and yeah, right. that's, yeah, it's I an, hope I never ever have to even consider doing that. It's an it's an artisan product, and you're the artist, and you you know this is your your baby essentially, and you want to have complete oversight on it, which makes a lot of sense to me. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's also another piece. There's sort of the environmental piece, right, where a lot of these things are made in China and Taiwan, and the process of making carbon fiber actually, you know, isn't that fantastic for the environment. So if you can at least mitigate that a little bit by not, not having to ship yeah. it all over the place and, and all that stuff, I think I think it's noble, not only uh, a good idea. And then it's all, it also allows me to have full control. So if there's anything ever that's, that would be failing for some reason, then it's very easy for me to change it. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's also been a part, I mean, the, the blue paddle hasn't been on stock because I'm not, I don't want to sell it. Uh, and the swim run paddle has been kind of like almost in stock that, since I launched it in all sizes. Uh, but that one always, also was like, I wanted it to be, I wanted to be able to stand by it hundred percent before I yeah. like just did it in order to, sell them yeah because i don't want to like i don't want to sell something that's not the best or you know the best that is possible to make and it's it's always going to be a learning curve i mean i already have uh, you know two more um of the swim run model two more versions that's coming out because i want to be able to you know give like an ultra pro like super duper light one where you have to flip them around, like you can't climb anything with it because mm-hmm. you're gonna break it. Like I want to make one one of that one like that for someone like myself that I'm never gonna use them to climb a, a rock ever. Um, and then the model that I currently have, and then like a heavy duty one. If you are afraid of like breaking them, or you mm-hmm. use them in training every single session uh, outdoors. So, so Frank, um, I have I have an important question. This is hotly debated on mm-hmm. our show with our guests: big paddles, medium paddles, or small paddles. Where 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 do you land on what swim runners should be using? Right size. <laughs> ah, <laughs> oh, 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 what very a clever, answer. very political answer. Love it. I mean, the, there is. I would say it depends on. First off, your hand size and how efficient you are in the water. And as soon as you have the least bit of a a faulty stroke that you're going to have to pay for with, you know, impingement or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. then you're going to suffer having a big paddle. And you're also going to slow down your stroke rate. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a a really hard question because it it varies. I mean, I, I have... I've made triple XL carbon fiber paddles, custom. Whoa. And I sell an extra small that's, you know, that is the size of, a, of an iPhone, basically. Sounds cute. So, wow. I mean, it's, there's everyone out there. Right. That's cool. And if you're like me, I mean, I'm, I'm six foot four, 200 pounds. Like for me and with big hands, like for me, a large paddle is, you know, feels doesn't feel big mm-hmm. like that's a high stroke rate kind of paddle for me yeah, yeah. well you know that's so, that's that's some of what we've heard on the show as well it's like getting the paddle that's right for you and stroke rate is is more important than necessarily having like the biggest paddle that can move as much water as possible yeah and we uh yeah we had john stevens on a uh, very f- quick american swim runner out of portland maine and he had some great tips about open water swimming. If, if it's a more turbulent uh, water, maybe there, you know, you want something that you're going to be able to turn those, turn, turn your stroke over a lot quicker than the big, if you had huge dinner plate or, or trash can lid type paddles and you got huge waves and chop that you're trying to, trying to make your way through, having those on are just more points for kind of turbulence to mess your stroke up or take your stroke the, the other way. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I totally agree. So yeah, I would say it's, uh, I don't think it's ever going to be like, you need, like you should always have a medium or you should always be, have a small or a large or whatever. I think it's going to end up being like, you need maybe two sizes or maybe even three uh, for the, all the different conditions and different. I mean, if you have a really long swim segment or you have a, a super short swim segment, of course it's going to, like it's going to change a little bit your swim speed. Mm-hmm. If you can go all out on a, you know, a 50 meter, um, yeah. or, or have a, uh, you know, a, a mile swim. 
in in shock wave waters. It's gonna it's gonna change quite a bit. Yeah, nice. But I mean, for I, I was doing uh, with the triple XL paddles. I, we were doing like hundred meter, like full blown, you know, balls to the walls kind of intensity, and you know that's a that's a workout. Uh, you you you'll use muscles you didn't know exist. <laughs> Like you, oh, I thought I had lats, but then there's something else back there. Like I don't know what that is, or your triceps. Something else back there, and it's sore. (laughs) Yeah, it's hurting right now. (laughs) Love it. I think it's really helpful to have have many. Actually, I mean, the optimal would be to have three different sizes, basically. Yeah. Nice. And then Frank paddles just you by yourself. You're 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 laying up the carbon yourself. You're doing everything, or you got a little small team there in Sweden and. How, what kind of, how big is the company? No, I mean, it's, it's definitely like grassroots. I mean, I, so in, in, um, when COVID hit, so was that March, I think the end of March, I lost my ability. So I was renting, um, like from a friend's company, like space to, to have my carbon fiber manufacturing, Mm -hmm. uh, and I lost that ability. So for like a good month, I was like, oh, that's probably the death of Frank Powell. So I had an opportunity through a friend to rent out a, a small factory, which is way too big for what I need for it, like what I needed for. Uh, and, you know, it just like took everything I owned and put into it in order to keep making Powell's. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it was kind of half a year ago, it could have disappeared for sure. Wow. Wow. And you, and you didn't disappear. You, in fact, you just doubled down, which I love it. Yeah. I was like, if I don't, like, I would just, re- I would have regret that for the rest of my life. If I, you know, yeah. knowing that I had the opportunity, see how, like where I can take it. Yeah. Awesome, man. I believe, like, if you believe it, if you, you know, if you actually produce something that, you're really like yourself. You're like, yeah, maybe there's people like me out there. They can like, I mean, you can just do a math calculation on like having half the weight of your paddle, like two of them. Um, like what the weight saving of like the swim and the run is like every step, every stroke. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's, there's no, there's no denying that it was a great idea and I mean, I think it's just it's just great. I love the sort of entrepreneurial spirit and the way that you're like, hey, let's see, let's see where this goes. So, so I think that's amazing. And and yeah, congrats. We're we're stoked to try them out at some point. Um, but but Frank, thank you so much for being on the show. This was super educational. Yeah, I'm <laughs> um, for for us. And uh, and then yeah, we just really appreciate you taking the time to, um, to talk story. with us. Hey, my pleasure. And then I, I want I just want to do a little call out to yeah. to all the people that like been helping me with uh, all the testing and all the prototypes and you know the the girls at um, uh, Annika Vestin and Maria Ruman of uh, Wild Yeah um, Wild's Fun Run super helpful and like all the triathletes throughout the years. Um, it's just been like I just want to give them a huge thanks for. Um, for helping me and all my friends, you know, taking, you know, putting up with all my, uh, long hours and uh, <laughs> weird requests. We're familiar. Our, our, yeah. our friends and, and wives and partners and, are, yeah. and my girlfriend yeah. for, uh, for, uh, you know, sticking with me. Nice. Yeah. Just make your like a carbon fiber or something cool and, and, and you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't like the carbon fiber. I tried. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, hey, I, uh, I've been uh, at my old apartment, like when before she moved in five years ago. I I built like everything out of carbon fiber in the in the bathroom. <laughs> just because you could, but, uh, <laughs> love it. Just because, I, yeah. And then with the new apartment, uh, she didn't want it anywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty great. Uh, yeah, if anyone uh, is interested in checking out Frank Paddle, frankpaddle dot com, and then on Instagram as well, Frank Paddle, and we'll include all this good stuff in the show notes, but. Uh, Frederick, once again, thank you so much for coming on and, and chatting with us about swim run and paddles and dropping some carbon fiber knowledge. 
Thanks, guys. It was a it was a true pleasure, and I uh, I hope. Uh, do you, are you guys going to Sweden next year? Do you have any? Uh, well, plans? let's see if we're allowed to go anywhere from the United States. But yes, we are planning um, sort of like a a European tour uh, whenever we're allowed. Uh, because yeah, we would we would love to to sort of see everyone that we've been interacting with all year, and and definitely go to the birthplace of the sport that we've um, grown to love. Yeah, we should totally uh, meet up. We'll definitely, keep in touch. definitely. Yeah, That'd for sure. Awesome. All right, Frank. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Low Tide Boys, a swim run podcast. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a review on iTunes if you're so inclined. You can also sign up for a newsletter at lowtideboys.com. That's boys with a Z. And check out our meme page at the Low Tide Boys on Instagram. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, drop us an email at lowtideboys at gmail.com. We'd like to thank Writing Easy Records for our show music and, of course, our wives for their support and tolerance of our swim run activities, hobbies, and other bullshit we do. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> you can support our efforts on Patreon. Until next time, get out there and go for a swim. And then a run. And then another swim. Then another run. And then another swim. And then run to the finish line. And just keep going until you're done. Yes. Or until run you to cross the, or, the finish line. Or run to the car. Or run to your car. Somewhere. Just keep running. Please.